Okay, welcome to everybody to the first seminar uh, after the holidays in, the, in our research institute. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Beza Gezarkani. He is a professor in uh, operation management at the uh, Business School of Southampton, it's the University of Southampton in the UK. He is the chair of a research group on operation and project management. And uh, uh, it is the first time he is visiting us, and we hope not the, uh, the last. And <laughs> he's, he's working on operation management and game theory and supply chain management as well. And today he is going to talk to us about some um, uh, model on global agricultural supply chain and uh, some tariff rate quotas using non cooperative models in, in game theory. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, everybody, for being here. It's my absolute pleasure to visit you. And uh, when Anna asked, uh, asked me to come to Alicante, it was oh, yeah, an obvious yes for me, because uh, doing my uh, studies and my, through my PhD studies, and after that, I knew Anna. And I learned a lot from her, from distance, just reading her papers, and yeah, it's a, it's a pleasure for me to be here and uh, presenting to uh, her group. Uh, so my name is Bezata Zarkani, as uh, Anna mentioned, uh, from Southampton in UK. So Southampton is in the south of UK, and there is a port in there. So Port of Southampton is one of the famous ports in, uh, in the UK. And uh, I don't know if it's a coincidence that I've got uh, hired there recently because of this research or it was uh, uh, unrelated. But uh, since 2019, I've been working on, um, on, on this topic, uh, on global trade and international supply chains, uh, mainly because we get the funding. So uh, before applying for funding, before receiving this fund, which is from the British Academy of Management and Australian and New Zealand Academy of Management. So there was a joint call from these two institutions. So they said, OK, we are going to fund some research projects um, which tackle things that are of common interest to the UK and Australia, New Zealand. And we wrote a proposal and we receive this small fund, which allows us basically to travel and uh, meet with co-authors there. So before 2019, I did not know much about what's going on on the global scale of supply chain. And I'm very happy to stand here and tell you from my experience during those three years. Because what I figured out is that in the operations research, operations management community, we are not really dealing with global trade, and we should, because there is a lot of supply chain operations managed issues there which, is, which are not uh, delved into. So most of the research in the in area of uh, international trade and uh, global supply chains done by economists. Uh, but hopefully by the end of this talk, I'll convince you that there is room for us operations researchers and operations managers to, you know, say things which are of value in this, in this domain. Um, so 2019, early 2019, I did not know what tariff rate quota was. Yeah, so if you don't know what tariff rate quota is, don't worry. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, some basics talk about this tariff rate quota, TRQ. And uh, we did a case study for this research um, on the, uh, the trade of beef from Australia <laughs> to the UK. OK, so trade. Trade is important because not only that we don't have things that we want, yeah, we want what do we want? We want rice, but it's not pretty much uh, you know, in Europe, I think. 
in the entire Europe is not very suitable for rice. Maybe it is, I don't know much about rice, but just an example. Uh, so we need to import rice because people like to eat rice. So sometimes it's because we don't have things that we do trade, but also it's not always the case that we don't have things. So your, for example, in the case of beef, in the case of meat, Europe exports beef. Europe and UK export beef, but we also import beef. Yeah? I'll, I'll tell you why. Uh, but it's sometimes because we do trade uh, to have a variety of things. So cons consumers in the EU and the UK wants to have beef, yeah, steak, but they want to also have Argentinian cuts, Brazilian cuts, lamb shank from New Zealand, Australian, I don't know, Wagyu uh, beef. So we need, we need the diversity. We need, the consumers want diversity and we want open the market, open the uh, domestic market to trade so that we have diversity. It's also good for resilience because maybe at some point in some years we don't have a good year, uh, we don't produce enough beef or enough, any, enough wheat or anything. Um, so we want to have the importation mechanisms in place so when needed, we import more. So that's the idea. So we need it for resilience, we need it for variety. The thing is that we don't need too much. Yeah, we don't want the Irish uh, farmers run out of business because it's, you know, it's cheaper to produce uh, Australia, in Australia, for example, beef. Yeah, so in agriculture, this is always a, an area in the new market paradigm, the open market kind of concepts that we are living, that requires protection. Nobody protects a, uh, I don't know, an, uh, a high, an IT piece of so a, a piece of uh, electronics. So if your if your company wants to uh, produce a piece of electronics domestically, most of the time there is no no safety net for them. It's not like that. We're gonna protect you. So do you do you do make phones in the country? We protect you. We don't let the uh, iPhones come in and you know bust your business. It does not happen a lot in that domain. But in, in, in agriculture, it happens always. So we want to make sure, because it's a, uh, it's a critical uh, sector, and um, a lot of people are involved in that, and we want to have some level of self-sufficiency. So we want to protect domestic production. We do not, we do not want to inundate the domestic market with imported products. And we, we ruin our farmers, we leave them no uh, profit, but next year maybe Australian find China to be a better market, so they import everything there, and there's, so we, we run out of uh, steaks, which I would not like to face that scenario. I don't know about you. Um, yeah, so um, governments employ a range of instruments to control the amount of imports. You say, we in Europe probably want about 100,000 tons of beef via importation. The rest we do, but say about 100,000 tons is where we put the mark that we want this much import. Too much of that would be too much. It would hurt us. And, uh, well, too little if nobody imports that there's something wrong with our mechanisms because then we don't have that diversity, we don't have that resilience. So we don't want too little and we certainly want too much. Too much is even worse. So we can do these things. We can say we as European Union would allow 100 tons, 100,000 tons of beef to be imported. And after that, if we have that 100,000 tons, we shut the door, we don't let anything in. Yeah, that's one idea. But it's against the open markets and trade. So WTO does not allow that. WTO, World Trade Organization, does not allow such restrictive measures to be in place. We cannot say, at some point, 
we're not going to let anything in. Markets should be open. Yeah. So what is the substitute? 1998 something. Uh, Uruguay rounds of, uh, oh, 1996. Uruguay round agreements of agriculture, they came up with this idea of tariff rate quota. So instead of saying we do not let things in after certain points, we're going to do these things. We say we have a low duty, that's uh, how much you need to pay to bring, to clear customs and bring the products into the market. So customs, you are, you are all familiar with customs. So things coming from uh, external sources, they have to go through customs for quality control and also for import duty. So instead of saying no more after 196 ton, we say we have a low tariff until this point. As soon as we have our total imports more than this quota limit, we're going to charge high tariff. In this case, 805 uh, euros per ton. That's the idea of tariff rate quota. That's it. We have a low tariff. It's, it's a two-step mechanism. Low tariff, high tariff, and the mark where it becomes active. Yeah. So if we are importing uh, ship meat, We're going to pay 10% until the total uh, import is less than this within a quota period. After we hit that, it's going to become more expensive to import. That hopefully prohibits too much imports, restricts the amount of uh, foreign goods into the country. Yeah, so we have some, something like this uh, in terms of uh, EU and UK. We, uh, we import things, a lot of agricultural things. This is mainly an agricultural mechanism. TRQ, tariff rate quota, mainly is an um, agricultural tool, 99%. Although uh, at some point they, politicians use it for other products. I think Donald Trump put a tariff rate quota on washing machines at some point. So not too many Samsung washing machines in the US. They was to try to reduce that, but it's mainly um, agricultural. Yeah. So uh, as a block, EU and UK produce a lot of beef themselves. Yeah. We also export a lot, but we also import a lot. Why? We import and export at the same time. Why can't we just use what we produce? It's because we like steaks. We like don't like offals. What is offals? The guts, the lungs the liver, the tongue, the head, the tail. We don't like that. They're tasty. We don't like them. I mean, average consumers don't like them. We like steak. So we export those cuts and import good cuts, good steak cuts. That's why we import. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, we import from limited number of countries. Um, and most of the trade happens through Rotterdam. So if you look at the statistics, you see that Netherlands imports way too much produce of any kind compared to their population, because that's the gate. That's where everything goes and then get distributed through, the, through Europe and the UK still. If you are importing to the UK from Australia, you can go to Netherlands and then there announce that this product is headed for the UK market. And then you cross the channel, nobody asks you to pay a duty. So it's the same as before Brexit. Now the supply chain is very long. The farm, you know, it takes about sometimes to raise the cattle, yeah? I know it takes about three months to raise chicken. I don't know about beef. I, I say it's less than a year or maybe a bit more. So they have to raise the cattle. Then it's going to go through an auction. The exporter would buy the produce and then it would be processed. Slaughterhouse, yeah, not so nice. Packaging 
customs, outbound, outbound customs, shipping, coming to the uh, um, country of destination. We have inspection there, customs there, distribution until it gets to the retail and we can use. Yeah, it's very long, very complicated. For example, if a farmer in Australia wants to export beef to Europe, they have to put the cows six months in advance on a specific feed. So you, before you kill the poor cow, you have to feed them certain diets with specific nutrients in it according to the EU laws so that you can uh, export, import that into Europe as grain fed or grass fed, these are different products by the way, into the country. Yeah? So six months on a special diet, about between two and three months on the vessel. Yeah? And poof, coming here, coming here, in the, f uh, in the refrigerator, in the supermarket, we buy it. And that is, I'm not talking about frozen beef. It is what is called fresh slash chilled. So it comes in this box. This is what you have, what you can buy in a meat market in London. Uh, it comes like this. It's not frozen. It never was frozen. It was like this. But the product has about five month shelf life. Yeah? This beef has about five months shelf life. This is the production date. This is the best before date. Yeah? And this time is for transportation and warehousing and distribution and everything. Yeah? So it's uh, coming from Australia, uh, strip loin, wagyu, probably expensive. Uh, I got the picture, not, I didn't taste it. Okay. Too expensive for academics. Uh, so what happens is that sea freight, most of it comes from sea freight, it takes uh, about four to six weeks and it has to be on refrigerated containers, uh, 20 weeks shelf life. There are different choices when the exporters want to ship this. You know, there are faster ways and slower ways depending on the uh, vessels where they go, would they have a transshipment point somewhere? So for example, if they can, the, the vessel can stop in Singapore and then the container goes to a different container, goes towards Rotterdam, or they can be on the same vessel through this same path. So it would be different times and different costs. So they have, we have these options. But you can even keep it in the stocks, you know, so you don't have to you don't have a rush, yeah? 12, 12 weeks of shelf life, you don't have a rush to really sell it to the market. So you have time for maybe even a few, at some point you find it reasonable to put it in a warehouse for some reason. You can still do that. Okay, so it becomes more specific to the trade uh, agreement between EU and Australia. Any questions so far? Okay. Um, okay. So, this is the mechanism under which beef can be imported into the UK. There are different mechanisms, and that is basically what the papers want to look at. One is whoever comes first can import, the other one is you need to have a license to import. Yeah? You need to have a approval that I can import one ton of beef to the EU. You can buy that, buy that uh, license, permission, or you can just show up and if you are not too late, you can import. That's, that's how the mechanism works. So one is the grain-fed beef. 
Erga omnis in Latin means, oh, my Latin is not good, open to all, open to all, not all, yeah, open to certain countries. 45,000 tons annually, first come, first serve. Canada, New Zealand, Australia, Uruguay, Argentina, and US can use this quota. They can come in and say, I'm from Canada, I've got beef for you, can I come in? They say, they look and say, okay, there is not too much already, so you can come in, whoever comes first. It's very popular because tariff is zero if you come before this is filled up. So before this 45,000 is filled up, if you want to bring beef into EU, UK, no tariff, free for all. Outside of that, so if we, are, we have already 45 tons of beef in this category already imported in the country, you're going to pay a 12.8% on, on the value of the produce plus a 2,000 euros per ton. So become expensive. So do we want, that's the mechanism to restrict, hinder importers from coming. Too much, too much imports. Its quota period also is divided into quarters. So we have four of these quota periods in a year starting from starting January, April, July, and October. So 45,000 divided by four is how much is allowed to come in each quota period. So from January to March, there is, you can, uh, there is uh, room for 12,000 and something tons of beef coming at zero tariff. More than that is uh, expensive. Now if you look at the data, this quota is most of it always filled up. All that is used. Everybody come for it because it's cheap. Now there is another mechanism also. High quality beef. It also can be grain fed. High quality beef can be grain fed, can be grass fed. It's a different category. It's called Hilton Quota because mainly this cut was imported by Hilton Hotels traditionally. 66.800 ton, thousand tons, yeah? What managed by a license. If you want to import uh, under this category, you have to buy a license, you have to get a license. How these licenses are allocated is a different story. I'm not going to go there. But you need to get a license somehow, and you can use it anytime you want. It's whenever you go, there's no rush. Yeah? Whenever you go, there's 20% tariff. It's still better than this, 12.8 plus 2,000 per ton, but it's not as good as zero. So we have Hilton quota usually filled up to 70% historically. Okay? Now what happens is that you, if you have a, if you have a, a container of beef which falls under this category, it can also fall in this category. So if you have a license, you can choose. Am I going to rush to go there first and import at zero, or should I chill and you know relax? And whenever the cargo gets there, gets there, I pay 20% tariff. That's the other option. You can use this. You can have a license or you cannot have a license. That's the first thing. But when you have a license, you can then decide, should I go and stand in the queue or should I just go use my pass license? So what, does, uh, what do people do? What do importers do? This is, well, this is a data and this shows equilibrium. What is this data? It is, the data is from Comtrade, 
ComTrade, it's a UN organization which is focused on trade data. It is available for free. You can get this chart in two minutes. I can show you later on. If you go to this site, you input the things that you want, you can get this two minutes. What is this? It is a monthly imp importation of fresh chilled beef to EU and the UK from Australia. From July 2018 to June 2019. So what is this? Um, how much importation we get every month? Firstly, there is a there is a bump, there is a hike always at the beginning of the quota period. Yeah. And uh, we are not even started and we are over quota. Yeah, this is the quarterly quota limit. Uh, so if we haven't even started and we are over quota, this is not, if we don't want to be over quota. Yeah, it's too much, too much import. So we have two problems here. We have over quota and we have this rush in the beginning. Yeah. So our research was, wants to understand why and how, how much, and how we can improve this. So that's basically what we want to do. That's uh, another chart which is interesting but is more complicated. So let me try to go through it. This is the same thing, quarterly imports, yeah. And the total quota that we have, this is the total amount of quota. That is the first come, first serve quota plus the licensing quota. It's total about, per quarter, about, say, 27,000 tons. So I told you about 12 something is first come, first serve. The rest is license. So what happens if we look at the utilization of this? instruments, import instrument. The first come first serve is always 100% filled. License users, well, sometimes completely filled, but you know, not always licenses are used. So this, uh, as the slides said, the average uh, utilization rate of the licenses are 70%. And we have over quota imports. That's what we don't want. Yeah. So people don't use their licenses, but import over quota. Seems to be a paradox. Why don't why we have licenses unused and people importing at just at the normal high rate, high tariff rate, without any, you know, not the zero one, not the 20% one. This is the 12.8% plus, plus 2,000 euro. People are export, using that to import, but not licenses, even though they're cheaper. So we try to answer these questions. Now, if you look at the, I, I told you that economists do research on these topics. And they have the same kind of questions that we have. Yeah? So we have the WTO have this special committee on agriculture meeting, COA, committee on agriculture meeting in WTO. And members meet uh, and they, you know, they converse, they talk about things and they document their questions and conversations. So within these documentations, there is 1,972 questions raised about the TRQ system. So even the economists are baffled by how TRQ works. And they are asking questions about, what about these field rates? What is, why do we have such a low uh, field rate on licenses? Why do we people export about imports out of quota. Uh, so they are asking this question. And also if you look at that, so this, are, this is the example of fresh chilled beef 
produced. This is one product, so this is one HS code. So in international trades, products are recognized by HS code, harmonized system, something. So fresh and chilled beef is 0201. That's HS code. But there are so many codes, so many producers. But if you look at all the TRQs that are in use, only 21% of them are functional. It means that they are close to fill rate. Yeah, most of, the, most of them are unutilized or overutilized. Yeah, so this is a problem. TRQs are not well managed and well understood. So we think it's because the operations management lens has been missing here. Yeah, that's the reason that there's this, this, if we look at supply chain management point of view, maybe we can answer these things. Yeah, so logistics, what, what about logistics? Well, lead time, mainly. The lead time that exists there in this, uh, in, in this supply chains, that would change a lot of decision-making structures. And by lead time, I'm not only referring to the six-week transportation time. It's another six months on top of that I told you about the putting the uh, cattle on feed. So if you think, okay, I, today I decide that I want to export a container of beef to the EU, that would take me probably eight months to make that realized. So this lead time impacts the decision-making structure. There is logistical choices, yeah? Which path? You can even bring in produce uh, with air freight. It's not common, but it happens. About 10%, something like that, comes uh, with air freight on, on, on airplanes. And we have this warehousing option. So what is this warehousing option? Well, in the um, international trades, you bring a product to the, to, the port, to the border of a country, then if you want to release the produce into the market, you have to pay customs. You have to make a custom declaration and then uh, pay the duty and get the cargo into the country. But you can buffer. There are things, there are, there are a concept called Customs bonded warehouses. So you bring the pro product into the country, put it in a warehouse, you don't sell it yet. It is still duty bound, but it is in a warehouse. So you can, once you arrive to, the, to Rotterdam, you can unload the cargo, put it in a custom warehouse, it stays there, you cannot sell it yet. Once you make custom uh, declaration, then the produce would be ready for free circulation, so you can uh, sell it into the market. So this option as well. So pretty logistic uh, picture here. And we want to look at uh, these questions, which I already explained. Why do we have over quota, under quota? What about timings? What is this bump at the beginning of the period? How big is this warehousing effect? And how can we improve the design of TRQ systems? These are import mechanisms. So from, the, from a mechanism design point of view, we would like to design better mechanisms to achieve what we want. OK. Any questions before I get into the math? Do I need to introduce all the notations? Can, can we just skip it? OK, let's just skip it. It's boring, yeah? Uh, we look at this mechanism separately. Yeah, Mechan look at this mechanism separately. First, look at this license. License, what is license? I have a license, I can import at this tariff. Yeah, this is the selling price in the market. It depends on how much, what is the volume of importation. So Q is importation decisions of the players. 
Should I import or should I not import? It's a zero one variable. Yeah. Maybe you cannot skip after all. Yeah. Strategy of a player. If import decision of every player. Should I import a container or not? That's why one container. If I wanna, if I can import five containers, I can say I can break it down into to five players, each with one container. Should I or should I not? That's the question. And this bold is the stretch profile of everybody, and we use this s as the sum of this vector. Yeah, so s would be total importation under Q. P S of Q is the price in the market as the result of this much importation. So the market selling price goes down as more import volume, more, more volume of produce is imported. Yeah, demand and price and demand, supply and demand. Yeah. So as the more produce imports, uh, price goes down. Production costs, um, profit function. So profit of a player depends on how much it sells, but also it depends on how much other people are importing. Yeah? So the price, eventual price, minus cost, times zero or one, you know, based on the decision. And this is how much the mechanism, this is the import duty. How much import a duty I should pay as a player. And it also depends on total amount of imports. Yeah. Uh, M is quota limit, low tariff quota, high tariff, uh, low quota tariff, high tariff quota, uh, tariff. Okay. We make this variable, do I have a license or do I not have a license? WI equal one, I have a license, I can import at this tariff rate. I don't have a license, I have to import at this tariff, which probably most of the time makes it the whole thing negative with this. This is large enough, this is the out of quota tariff. Tariff of importing without a license, yeah? And uh, so we can find an equilibrium here for who imports and who does not import. And all the equilibriums we get here are of the same structure. So if we arrange all the players by their costs, so the most efficient player who has the lowest cost first, so now player number one has the least amount, least cost, most efficient, the best player. And as we go, players, player go up in numbers, their costs in, in, increase. Does, or at least does not decrease. Yeah, so if we sort all the players by their cost efficiency, then there is a point that we draw the line, everybody on this side import QI equal to one for every people on this side, QI equal to zero for every people on the other side, yeah? So that would be the equilibrium. We just need to uh, find the last person who can, f uh, ben uh, who can profitably imports, yeah? So we can calculate the NE. Um, if we choose V to be large enough, nobody, there's gonna be no over quota import because it does just, it's not financially viable to import up without a license. What is the policyholder uh, objective? It has two objectives. One is about the fill rate and the other one is about Total profit, revenue, revenue, not profit, revenue for the policymaker. So if at equilibrium M players import, um, then this is the expected profit of the last importing player. So the least efficient player we can increase the tariff until the last importing player almost gets nothing. Last importer would have almost zero tariff and all the least, less cost efficient players would not import. So 
the policy maker can choose this tariff in such a way that the last importing player is, uh, remains with no profit. So that would be how much revenue we can generate from one player. And if M players are importing, M times that would be total amount of revenue that this policymaker earns. So what just we need to figure out how much, what is the optimal amount of M. So we check for all M's within this uh, range. What is this alpha? This is the lower bounds that we want for the uh, mechanism. So the, uh, we don't want more than M player to import. That is our tariff, uh, that is our uh, quota limit. We don't want more than M player import. We don't want less than 10% of that uh, importation. So we put a lower bound on this M and we can pick the M here, which maximizes the policymaker uh, revenue. And that is the licensing mechanism. That's it. Not very complicated. Any questions? The way it's allocated, yeah. no. Usually what happens is that the EU talks to Australia and says, you have 10,000 tons of licenses. There you go. And then Australia would invite importers, so whoever wants apply, and they look at their history and their financial standing and say, okay, here one for you, one for you. One. Sorry? To, to allocate, yeah. yes. They look at, but it's always kind of a disadvantage the smaller companies, SMEs, because these licenses are mostly um, uh, allocated to the established companies. Well, they were sustainability issue. I don't think so, but what they do consider is that I get a license this year and I don't use it. Next year, I'll, it's my utilization rate is a function, uh, it's a variable that determines if I get it next year. So if I'm greedy, I get the license, get, let's get the licenses, yeah? I may import and I may not import. And you don't use it, you waste it Australian as a nation exporting power. So you'll be penalized for that. You, if you don't use the license, next year you're not gonna get it, something like that. It's just like, it's, it's like airport landing slots. If you don't use it, you lose it. Yeah, that's why airplanes prefer to operate empty planes inst instead of losing that landing slot. Okay, so what about the first come first serve system? First come first serve system is easy. Whoever comes in first gets in. So if a 10,000 quota um, first come first serve license, we open, it's 1st of April, the gates are open, the first 10,000 tons of beef who comes can go through at f no tariff. More than that, wait a minute. Pay the, pay the out of quota tariff, yeah? But because of this long transportation leg, the lead time, a player cannot know where they land in, in, in the queue, yeah? If they are exporting today, they need to wait six weeks to see who gets there first which is a random phenomenon. So if I and J and K export, they, we can have customs queues, yeah? Different customs queues, yeah? So in some of them, if the, if the quota here is two, you know, in this queue, in this queue, K cannot import. In this queue, J has to pay extra, yeah? But overall, the probability of arriving 
after the quota is filled is this. This is, so uh, we have m units of quota. What is the, if sq number of people are arriving, so the quota is 10 units, there are 20 people coming, so the probability that a player B in the second 10, so be a player B in the position 11, 12, 13 to 20 would be one, one, one minus this. So this is the probability of being out of quota. Of course, if the total arrivals is less than the quota limit, this is zero. So nobody pays the uh, out of quota tariff. But if twice as many player as the quota limit arrive, then there's a 50% chance that the player pays the out of quota. Make sense? Make sense? So everybody imports at the low tariff, but there is a probability you pay that extra fee. And this is the probability. So, and this is a profit function. With this, we can calculate, again, the equilibrium. Equilibrium has the same pattern. Players are arranged based on non-decreasing non order of their costs. Um, OK, if we use the same parameters as the licensing. So now we compare the licensing and um, first come, first serve. With the same set of variables, with the same set of uh, parameters, first come, first serve generates more revenue. Yeah? Because now there are people who think, well, it's only 10% chance that I'm going to pay the over quota, so I'll go. So there's always more people coming with the same set of parameters. But the thing is that it can only generate more revenue if it's over quota. So more revenue means over quota. We had these two, um, two mechanisms, licensing and first come, first serve. So if you want to use the first come, first serve, we cannot achieve both objectives of the revenue of the policymaker in terms of more revenues and, in, uh, and field rate not exceeded or, or quota not exceeded. We can only get more revenue if the quota limit exceeds. So it's, uh, it's what it is. OK, how much time do you think I'll show? OK, so let's go fast forward mode. We can combine the two, because in reality, these are used in combination. So at the figure that I showed you, a player can choose to either use the license or go stand in the queue. Yeah? But if the licensing fee is more than just the first come, first serve tariff, people do this. I have a license, OK, I'm going to go there. I'm gonna, if I get in time, I'm not going to use my license. I'm going to just go in the first come, first serve system. But if I'm late, I use my license. That's a dual TRQ system. And now, the people who have a license who have, and the people who do not have license that they have a different profit. So a, pe a, a person with a license, yeah, there is, if they, they want to use the first come, first serve system, all both of them, either with the license or without license, they want to use the first come, first serve because that is more profitable, at least in the case of meats that we discussed. If I'm late, if I'm over quota, then I use my license. These guys without license, if they are over quota, they have to pay the out of quota tariff. Yeah? And then we calculate an Nash equilibrium here, and we calculate the policymaker's expected revenue. But what we find is, uh, is that 
a dual TRQ system generates uh, better revenue compared to the pure either TRQ, uh, uh, either of the TRQ system. So the first result of the paper is if we combine the two in a smart way, we get more revenue for the policy. So policymakers, by combining the two tariffs, can stay within the tariff limit, yet yeah, not over quota. They can remain within the tariff range and have more revenue. And then we say, okay, what if people can choose when to arrive? Yeah, they arrive earlier. They have to pay more to arrive early, or they have to pay. Yeah, if they want to be, if they if they want to use the first come first serve, you can pay an extra for the transport, and you arrive early, or increase the chances of arriving early. So that's another option. And the, another option is that if we get there after the quota is filled we put it in the bonded warehouse. This is another option. And we calculate and see uh, basically which system works better. Now first, do I have the results here? Yeah. So, yeah, I can just... No, 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 it's just tell you the punch lines. First, dual TRQ systems are better than uh, individual ones. So we, if we combine them, we get better. Second, people are better off using warehouses in many cases than trying to expedite their transportation. So instead of rushing, come early and put the cargo in the warehouse. It's what's happened in a large range of um, conditions. So, if we revisit this figure, now we can explain. What is this graph I showed you? It was the importation of beef into the EU UK, yeah, from Australia. The thing is that this data is the timing of custom declarations. So if you see in April uh, is, there is a uh, hike, it's because a lot of custom declarations happened in April for clearing beef. It doesn't show where the cargo arrived in the country. So what we find out, what we, uh, well, at, at least hypothesize, is that most of these people have arrived here. They're just waiting in the warehouse, and in April they make the declaration. So there is a difference between arrival time at the destination market and the custom declaration or the time that the product is ready for free circulation in the country. So the option of warehouse is used extensively in a TRQ system like this in order to allow players to take advantage of the first come first serve system without risking uh, being out of quota or paying too much for fast transportation. Yeah. That's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>